to islands, to um, all over the low country. And um, I'm coming to you from the um, St. Michael's Church Rectory, uh, this house where uh, the clergy of St. Michael's have lived for a long time, uh, since really around the 1780s. And uh, there are many crazy stories about this house. And um, it's at 76 Meeting Street, right next to the church. And uh, one of my favorite stories comes from uh, Hugh Wilson, uh, who's a longtime parishioner, and uh, when Hugh, uh, he's now a retired doctor, but before uh, uh, his um, world in medicine and before he became an adult, he uh, would hang around here with the clergy kids, and they'd go up to the third floor, and they'd take this mannequin, and they would throw this mannequin off the third floor with fishing line onto Meeting Street, and then drag it, you know, down a little bit from that third floor, and um, it would cause, um, you know, car accidents and all kinds of things. And so there's been a lot of craziness here in this house that we uh, we love sharing these old stories. Um, and uh, we have modern stories as well. My wife and I have um, three children and uh, we're all crazed uh, football fans. And uh, we are big Carolina Gamecock fans and on the college level and uh, a big um, New England Patriot fan growing up there in Boston. And I tell you this because if you are walking by this house during a Gamecock or Patriot game, uh, you will hear um, this horn go off uh, after every touchdown. Now, granted, this has been a bad year for Patriot and Gamecock fans in general, okay? Um, but now I do have a bigger horn for the playoffs, but this is our our regular horn for the regular season. Um, but we, we love uh, football. We are a very competitive family and uh, our neighbors don't love it as much. Now on one side, there are basically dead people in the churchyard. On the other side, we've got some folks that um, really don't like our horn that much at all. But who could forget the last minute wins of the previous years against Seattle and Atlanta but when they won, the Patriots won their third Super Bowl in 2004, uh, I was then pastoring a church in Washington, D.C., and one of the men uh, on our usher team worked in the uh, White House. And bless his living soul, he scored my wife and me a ticket to the Rose Garden uh, when the Patriots went to greet the president after their Super Bowl win. Uh, you know, my heroes at the time, Tom Brady, now turned Judas, but in any case, uh, Bill Belichick, Teddy Bruschi, all my heroes. And because my wife is not in the room, I can tell you it was perhaps one of the most amazing events outside my wedding, outer body for sure. And uh, there was an uh, opportunity at that time to get autographs at the end of the uh, presentation. But as part of this true story at our church, we happened to have a funeral the morning of this um, White House event. And I can tell you, it was the fastest, quickest dispatch of a funeral we've ever had. We went very fast, we buried him quickly, and I raced down to Connecticut Avenue to the White House, didn't have time to change clothes, I had my collar on, but I had my New England Patriot jersey on underneath my collar and a big Sharpie pen and I immediately, after that presentation, turned into a 15-year-old super fan, and I um, opened my shirt when I got to Tom Brady, and I said, Tommy, sign me, baby, and he took his big marker, and he signed his name on my jersey, and my wife said, Al, you're a moron. In any case, um, it was a wonderful experience, and uh, the point of the story, and there is a point of the story is that several weeks after winning that Super Bowl, Tom Brady was interviewed on 60 Minutes. And during that time, Tom said, you know, there are times I wake up in the morning thinking to myself, after three Super Bowl trophies, that was way back then, uh, he said, there must be more to life than this.
this. And I've never forgotten that. Uh, if you Google uh, Tom Brady on 60 Minutes, it's a very arresting statement that he made with that question, is there more to life than this and, and all these trophies? Now, I would say no. I say that four Super Bowls and more, that's enough. No, just kidding. But um, tonight, I want to look at that question. Is there more to life than that? Now, granted, it's safe to say that some of you are on this Zoom tonight because you're asking that question. Is there more? There's got to be more. Um, some of you have come because um, you're really not asking that question. Maybe you're here because another person asked you to be here or you're doing it for another person. Um, I don't care why you're on the call. I'm glad you're here, per period. Um, but the first time that I took Alpha, I was kind of forced to take it. Uh, my boss at the time made me take it. And uh, I was brand new to St. Michael's as a priest. And we were just you know, uh, launching the, the Alpha course. And so um, it was my job to introduce it. Uh, but um, I love the story uh, about uh, the... Um, uh, this Texan, speaking of Texas, Shelley, this wonderful Texan who had this great big plantation and um, he would always have a major black tie party every year. And uh, as part of that big party, they would gather by the pool and he would give the same offer. Whoever uh, swims in my pool one lap will get, uh, with all their clothes on, will get a million dollars or uh, my um, daughter's hand in marriage. Now, this was a saltwater pool with a shark in it. And uh, nobody, of course, took him up on the offer ever. Uh, until one year, um, the man hears this splash and everybody runs to the pool. And uh, there is this guy who's swimming for his life in the pool uh, as fast as he can to the other side of the pool. And, and nobody can believe what they see. The shark is on his tail and the guy gets out of the pool and the owner was like, I can't believe that you took me up on the offer. He said, the guy said, you know, what would you like, son? Would you like a million dollars? He's like, no, I don't need it. Would you like my daughter's hand in marriage? He says, definitely not. He said, what do you want? He said, I want the hand of the person who threw me in. Um, but, you know, sometimes we feel that way sometimes when we come to church or when we are involved in a course like this. Um, but I want to let you know that these Tuesday nights are so important for our life together. Uh, so important about being able to raise the question of, is there more to life than this? And what's really out there? And who is God? And what I love about Alpha is that we never take for granted that you know the answer or, the, or that we know the answers to that question. We, we always meet people where they are. Um, as if we've all just drop down from Mars, and we're all asking the same questions. It's the very beginning questions that I love to look at. And, um, and I think that in the South, in this part of America, um, we kind of take for granted that people know what Christianity is. But um, it's often, sometimes for the seeker, the last place we look for hope because it's so well-worn and so many people go to church down here. Um, sometimes it can be the last place that we look to for real hope in our life. Because in today's world, it's much easier to say, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Sikh, I'm one of the Eastern religions because they're remote and mysterious. And, and so what I wanna do tonight is to wipe off some of the wax off what it means to really be a Christian. Now, number one, um, I find that people don't look to Christianity because they see it as so boring. Maybe the church simply so dull. It was uh, Robert Louis Stevenson who once entered into his diary as if he were recording the most extraordinary phenomenon. He said, you know, I've been to church today and I'm not depressed. Well, as a child, you know, that was my reaction. I found it dull um, with no connection to my life. But the second reason we may not look to Christianity uh, is that it simply seems too unbelievable. Like Jesus coming back to life? What kind of influence could he have on my life these 2,000 years later? Um, how could I be forgiven for what I've done? What, what, you know, could it really be true? And so for many, our rejection of faith is that it's boring. It is irrelevant and untrue in my life. 
Um, but thirdly, again, um, how could that man influence my life today? I'll give you a little analogy for this. Um, years ago, when we lived in Washington, our church was right on the um, circle that we called Chevy Chase Circle. And our pews were in Maryland. The altar was in DC. The line of DC went right through our church. But if you've ever been to that part of DC, there's a, a rotary. And 24 hours a day, people are spinning through Chevy Chase Circle. And, uh, and ironically, here in Charleston, our church is located not on a rotary like it was there. Our church is on the four corners of law. And people have to stop. And I've often reflected on that, that that's really one of the differences in the North and the South. You know, in the South, people still stop for the church. In the North, people are just winding by and, and the church has no relevance in so many lives because people think it's just completely irrelevant, it has nothing to do with them. But the fourth objection of the church is maybe years ago, we were hurt by the church. Maybe the church wasn't there for us. Maybe we felt ignored by the church. Maybe we know hypocrites who are involved in the church, uh, you know, and, 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 and that has hurt us. Uh, maybe, you know, we called the church and nobody returned our call or that we felt again shunned or judged. All of these are really um, authentic objections. And if you're in any one of those camps, please know I've been there too. And it's not easy but thank you for giving the church a second chance. The church is a, an imperfect institution and we need second chances uh, just like relationships do. But to all of these objections, Jesus said something crazy. Jesus said for every person on earth, he said, I am the bread of life. Meaning I'm the one person who can satisfy the hunger of the heart that is in every human heart. As one um, ancient man, St. Augustine said, he said, um, every human heart has a hole in it, yet that hole can only be filled by God. You can put everything else into it. You can put relationships, you can put work and, and hobbies and, and Super Bowl trophies and, and even drugs and alcohol and still, we're all left with the empty feeling that, that something really is missing inside. After all, how many of us have said over time that while I, I like to think Christianity is true, um, even through all my objections, I have to admit something is missing in my heart. One of the greatest columnists of the English journalistic scenes was Bernard Levin. And at one point in his life, he said, countries like England are full of people who have all the material comforts they desire, a happy family, uh, and yet so many lead lives of quiet and at times noisy desperation. Freddie Mercury, the lead singer in the rock group Queen, had amassed a huge fortune, attracted millions of fans, but admitted in an interview shortly after his death that he was desperately lonely. He said this, you can have everything in the world and be the loneliest man. And that he said, is the most bitter type of loneliness. He said, success has brought me world idolization and millions of dollars, but it's prevented me from having the one thing I need, a loving and ongoing relationship. Again, Tom Brady, there must be more to life than this. It's why Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the one person who can satisfy your hunger. But then he puts feet on that identity by saying, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And I wanna just finally break those three things down a bit because they're really profound when we isolate each word and look at what Jesus really meant. First, Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say I am a way, notice. He said, I am the way. In other words, Jesus is saying, I've come to bring direction to a lost world. Um, 
one of the goals that my family and I have is to actually see every major league baseball park in the country by the time my children get to college. Now, COVID has hampered this a little bit, um, but we've hit 15 baseball parks and we have 15 left. And a couple of summers ago, we hit Miami, Florida, the newest park in the major leagues with a retractable roof and it looks like a spaceship. Um, we saw more of Florida than most Floridians see of Florida in that trip and we went everywhere. But had it not been for the Google map, GPS, uh, you know what I'm talking about, you know, when to make a U-turn, when to make a left and a right, um, uh, we never would have found the stadium because it's in a very counterintuitive part of Miami. And, um, and what I love about GPS, the Google map is uh, that it is so forgiving when you make a mistake, right? Rerouting, rerouting. And I always think about Jesus as our GPS, our source of direction. When we're going in the wrong direction, he's patient with us to bring us back. But his way is very specific. He brings us right to where we need to go and trying to do life without Jesus as the way to lead us through is like driving to DC in that maze of, you know, their, you know, traffic patterns and finding your way is very difficult. And as such, when we look at Jesus as the way, he answers questions like, where did I come from? Where am I headed? What should be my next move in life? Is God calling me to marriage? Does my life have any ultimate meaning and purpose? What happens when I die? You know, these are the big questions of life. And ultimately, there is only one relationship that is completely loving, totally ongoing, and that is that relationship with God. And so Jesus is saying, I am that way to that relationship for you and God. I am the way to find the purpose for which you were made. I am the way. And one of the realities about a GPS, back to that analogy, is that when you're using a GPS to get somewhere, it means that your conversation with your spouse or your friend or whoever's in the car with you can change. Uh, you're at peace with each other. You're not like, where, what did that map say? You're not tense, right? Because you're at peace. You're following that device. You can talk about other things. You can live, right? You can enjoy your surroundings because you know not only where you're going, but when you're going to arrive. It is a life and game changer. So Jesus said, I am the way, right? I am that GPS. But secondly, Jesus said, I am truth. Again, he didn't say I am a truth. He said, I am the truth, meaning Jesus is saying, I, I bring reality to a confused world. Now, sometimes people will tell me, but Al, you know, it's great that he satisfies that hunger for truth in you, but I don't have that need. Or people might say that truth might be for you, but it's not true for me. Or isn't that just kind of a crutch for what people who need to do that kind of thing do? And if you need that kind of thing. But, you know, Jesus saying, I am the truth, it wouldn't be truth if it was a truth for me and not for you. Uh, it's lovely, but it, it wouldn't be truth. So because if it's true, it's true for everybody. If it's not true, then it's not actually lovely for those who believe something that isn't true. Because when they're walking around in a deceived state, what kind of a loving God would want one person to receive truth and another not? One of my heroes in the faith is a man by C uh, named C.S. Lewis, a great author, as you know, and wrote Narnia and all those children's books. But C.S. Lewis said Christianity is a statement, which, if it's false, is of no importance at all. But if it's true, it's of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. But when Jesus said, I am the truth, he wasn't just talking about um, an intellectual truth, something of the mind. He wasn't, he was talking about that, but it's more than that. It was a truth as lived, a truth as experienced. And there's a big difference between a kind of intellectual knowledge only and a personal knowledge. For example, my wife and I, Libby, uh, we are going on our 20, um, sixth year, 27th year of marriage. I can't believe it. 
But supposing before we were married, before I had met her, I went into a bookshop and there was a book about her called The Amazing Libby. And I thought, well, that looks interesting. I'll pick it up and have a look. Chapter one, her sparkling personality. Chapter two, her extraordinary intelligence. Chapter three, her infinite patience. Chapter four, her love for stylish attire. Chapter five, her potential to be a long-suffering wife. Chapter six, her cordon bleu cooking skills. And the final chapter, her sporting ability. That would be a very short chapter in looking back. But if I'd looked at this book and thought, my goodness, she sounds like an amazing person. See, that's intellectual knowledge, head knowledge. But after nearly three decades of marriage, I can tell you she is an amazing person because we're in a relationship. And, it, and like good scotch, it only gets better. And when someone says, I know Jesus is the truth, they're talking not just about a, a intellectual truth, but they're talking about truth as, as lived, like a, a living, breathing, relational truth of Jesus. So Christianity is not just an intellectual hypothesis as much as it is a relationship with Jesus. And that's really exciting. So Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. And finally, Jesus said, I am life. I am the life, meaning he brings light into a dark world. And, uh, you know, there are two kinds of, of light and life, really. As you think about life, the life that Jesus brings, two kinds of life. There is life right now, as you and I are living it. And then there's life for eternity, like the forever life. It's very possible to be dead while you're alive. Unforgiveness, um, regret, anger, taking over the body, that can lead to death. I think of a headstone in London that said, Bob Jones died at 45, buried at 85. It's very possible to live without a heartbeat. I mean, I mean, without a spiritual heartbeat and just have no hope. Jesus came to set us free from the things that cause death in our life, the anger, the resentment, the regret, the unforgivenesses, the abuse, the things that are wrong in our lives, the mistakes that we make and the mistakes that have made against us. And sometimes those mistakes are very small, but they add up over time and hurt us. Other times they're really big and they are life-threatening and, um, and cause a, a, a slow death. Um, now, there's a big difference from the things we do that are wrong and the mistakes that we make. We make all make lots of mistakes and our mistakes can be relatively harmless or even amusing. Um, I love this article that details some of the mistakes that students have made on Sunday school tests. And one person wrote this. Moses led the Hebrew slaves to the Red Sea where they made unleavened bread, which is bread made without any ingredients at all. Moses went up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. He died before he reached Canada. I love these. Another wrote, the Greeks were a highly sculptured people. And without them, we wouldn't have history. The Greeks also had myths. A myth is a female moth. Another wrote, Socrates was a famous Greek teacher who went around giving people advice. They killed him. Socrates died from an overdose of wedlock after his death. His career suffered a dramatic decline. Well, those are innocent mistakes that can be made that are harmless. But the things that we do in life can really suck the life out of us. The biggest is unforgiven sin or our inability to forgive another. And this is huge. Nelson Mandela said, refusing to forgive is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Another, the great Russian novelist, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, classes, or political parties, but right through every human heart. 
and through all human hearts. So on all things, big and small, Jesus says, I have come to give you life, forgiveness. So new and forgiven life now, where on the cross, Jesus took everything you and I have ever done wrong, said wrong, thought wrong, and died in our place. In fact, if you had been the only person, he would have done it for you. He loves you that much. And because of that, it's possible for that guilt to be taken away. That guilt, that embarrassment, that shame, that anger toward another, he came to set us free from addiction even, those things in our life that we hate, that get a grip on us. So um, that is the beauty of, of this new life on earth that we can have. Meaning there's a day where we don't need to walk on eggshells. Our family doesn't need to walk on eggshells. Our anger is in check. We're living a new life of peace and, and strength. But the second life that I want to talk about briefly is the eternal life that we have. Like what happens after we die? For the Christian, we believe that life really actually begins when we die, right? We will live forever eternally. And uh, we don't need, therefore, to fear when we take our last breath on earth. In fact, I really do believe that the life we're in right now, my friends, truly is the prologue to the book. Chapter one begins when we die. This is why we call the gospel the good news. The life we're in right now is the prologue. Chapter one begins when we get to heaven. And that's why Jesus said, I am life now and forever. So um, is there more to life than this? I believe there is. Through Jesus, he says, I am the way. I am the truth. You can count on me. I am the life. Now, I truly don't think it's easy to be a Christian today. In fact, I think it's harder today, actually, to be a Christian than a non-Christian. Therefore, it's difficult to say Christianity is boring because it's such a challenging way to live. And if it's all untrue, millions and billions of people have been deceived. Indeed, I would say that Christianity is the most exciting way to live um, with every relevance for our life. And so with this in mind, when people say, well, you know, I, I might be a Christian, but I'm kind of a middle of the road Christian. Uh, I could never be an extreme Christian. Um, I would say, well, wait a minute. The extreme Christian is one who is both most loving and most lovable. The one who is most extremely forgiving and the most extremely forgiven. The most forgivable, the most forgiving, the master of the second chance and the master of what it means to live with compassion. And so my friends, I believe that if you dedicate your Tuesday nights to this course, it will change your life. I tell you, I have so missed, uh, I've been waiting for this night because um, I, it just brings such joy to me and, and, and a renewed strength to again, every Tuesday, shake the wax off faith took all the religion and denominational stuff out of it and, and, and get Christianity back down to the raw wood and say, what is it in the, what in the world do we really believe anyway? And that's what these nights are all about. They're fun. They're intellectually thought provoking. Uh, and, um, and, and, and in my life, um, it's real um, because um, I, uh, even though I was born into a Christian family, um, my, my father was not. And, and so I, I really respect people who have a conversion experience to Christ in their, um, um, uh, you know, in their adult years. And I'll end with a story uh, of my father um, that has everything to do with my story in faith. Um, my grandparents escaped the Holocaust in uh, Austria and Germany, they were Jewish. And uh, they came to this country uh, where my father was born in New York City. And my father uh, grew up as a Jew, although 
um, my grandfather became kind of a, an agnostic kind of atheist, um, believing that uh, how, you know, how could God allow a Holocaust to happen? And so he really um, decided that uh, he would never go back to synagogue, nor would he ever speak German again or buy a German product. And so he raised, uh, he and my grandmother raised my father as kind of a, a nominal Jew. But my dad, you know, was still um, uh, bar mitzvah and everything. And, and, um, and so my dad uh, went to Brandeis University um, and, and really felt a call actually to become a rabbi. After, even through his parents' agnosticism, um, he really had this call to be a rabbi. So he went to pre-rabbinical uh, school and as part of his rabbinical studies in Boston, he um, was asked to go to different churches to defend his faith. And so one night uh, he uh, went into the city of Boston and went to a church uh, in their evening service. And there was something there that shook him to the point that he kept going back and going back and going back. And um, one night he went to the altar, not to take communion, but to um, receive a blessing from the priest. He felt very called to do it. And it still brings tears to my eyes because you know, my dad is not an emotional man, but he said, uh, whenever he recounts a story, he says, Al, when the priest put his hand on my head, it was like a bolt of lightning going through my body with one question. What if everything Jesus said about himself was true. What if he really was and is the way, the truth, and the life? Now, my dad was about 28 when he had that revelation in pre rabbinical school, but now in 2021, uh, my father is 89 years old, and um, following that experience at that altar, he uh, left his rabbinical studies and went to seminary to become a priest. And uh, he has served as a priest. In fact, right now he is in charge of a church in Rhode Island at the age of 89 and leads that church on Zoom every Sunday and is unbelievable. I just talked to him tonight. He's so full of life and the Holy Spirit in terms of his faith. And, and you know, to me, that's proof in the pudding of everything Jesus talked about. I am the way, you can count on me. I am truth, I am life. Now, again, some of you I know and some of you I don't know. But again, it's all neutral territory tonight. And some of you might say, you know, I'm ready to make a commitment or a deeper commitment to Christ. And you know, why waste time? And, and if you're there, I wanna have a prayer with you of commitment and Commitment is really about three things when we talk about this with Jesus. It's, it's um, saying sorry, it's saying please and thank you. Lord, sorry for any, in my life, anything that I've done that has hurt you or another. Just take it away, like the garbage truck. Take the garbage out. Live in my heart, please. And, and help me live for you. So let's do that right now. And again, if you don't feel ready for this, that's okay. Um, or if you've already prayed it, um, I pray this prayer every day. Um, and if you want to pray it for the first time, join us. Let's pray. Father, we um, thank you that, that we do believe there's more to life than this because there's more to life beyond earth. And you came to prepare us for that life. It's amazing. So, Lord, I ask you. Um, your forgiveness, anything that I've done, we've done that has hurt you in any way or another person, shower us with your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much. You are the Lord of the second, tenth, and infinite chance. Would you live in our hearts? Would you live deeply in our hearts, enabling us to love you deeply, enabling us to love others deeply? Whether we live on John's Island or uh, on a boat in Florida, Lord, wherever we are, would you reach us where we are, meet us there, and lift us to another place of existence? In Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you all. And um, I just wish we could be in person, but I really, um, I look forward to these Tuesdays with you. And I hope that uh, we can commit to them and be relentless about keeping this on our schedule over these next couple of weeks. Paige, I give it to you. Thank you so much, Father Al. Wonderful words, wise words, and I always enjoy learning new things about my good friend, Elizabeth. <laughs> I won't tell her that you don't think she's very sporty. <laughs> yeah. um, I wanted to say some, <laughs> some of you, um, I don't have your email addresses. So if you haven't already emailed me, this is my email address. Um, it's Paige Grimble at stmichaelschurch.net. Is it being shown very well? Well, that's old school, Paige. You are doing it the old school way. I know. I am old school. I could put it up. I should have gotten Riley to make a screen. Um, but anyway, it's Paige Grimble, P-A-I-G-E, Grimble at um, stmichaelschurch.net, S-T Michaels. So just um, send me your, oh, Riley put it in the chat box. Okay. Thank you. So, um we will, um, if y'all have any questions and stuff during the stuff, but I'll go over this next time. But um, next week too, we'll be able to do the chat box and all that good things going on during the, um, well, not during the talk, but you could be doing the talk. <laughs> anyway, we just thank y'all so much for joining us and look forward to having y'all with us next week, seven o'clock every Tuesday from now until March 9th. And I hope this tonight's, um, conversation and, and talk from Al has been a blessing. So thank you. It was so nice to meet y'all. Blessings, everybody. Yep. Have a good night. We'll see you next week. Take care. Good night. Thank good you. Night. All right. Can I say good night, everybody? Thank you. Bye. Forgive me. We lost our boat people. <laughs> they signed off. <laughs> they did have guests. <laughs> oh, they were so they, right. Yeah. Oh, oh there we go. They did. Thank you, Al. That was wonderful. Uh, yes. So fun. Oh, can I ask a question? And I've thought of this before, but I really have always wanted to ask you, Al. Um, what church did your father have that experience in? Well, um, Mike, it, it's interesting. It's become kind of a pilgrimage church for our family, and it's Church of the Advent. Ah, yeah. yeah. Very familiar with it. Are you? Yeah. We went to uh, Trinity for a while. Yeah. Church of the Advent. Yeah. And then St. Paul's in Brookline. And then my parents left to go to the Anglican Church. Well, it's yeah. He and I met at All Saints in Brookline. Right. We met at All Saints in Brookline. That's amazing. <laughs> You know, um, you know, even though it, it's, and I interned at Trinity Copley Square, but I go back now and it's so sad because the gospel is just I know. You know, political yeah. ideology and yeah. it hurts my heart. But at Church of the Advent, you know, it's a very Anglo-Catholic, you know, high church scenario. And, and there's still something very beautiful there for our family. And my brother is on the vestry still there now. And it has just this lovely, you know, it's nestled, as you know, right there in the heart of the back bay in a beautiful um, um, brownstone environment. And um, uh, I'm so glad you you know what I'm talking about. It's very special. Very much. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Mm. Yeah. Well, I've loved our connections tonight. Yeah. Uh, the neighbors. That's awesome. That's and then the people who've just known each other for I don't know how or why. It's wonderful. And there are a couple of people who weren't able who did not uh, show up tonight, but then we had some extras. So I was very excited. Um, thank you all for your leadership and your time and your prayers. Yeah. Yep. So next week we go into small groups. 
Next week, we will go into small groups. There will be specific information given about Zoom. I'll have a little Zoom info session right at the beginning. Um, and then I'll talk about going into small groups when we go into it or okay. make sure we cover all that info when we do split. Okay. And Riley, can I make a, um, a request? Do you think we can, can we have some music when people are coming in? Yeah. I, Is I, that okay, Paige? I put like a little <clears throat> video up or... Or yeah, like, yeah, I can do that. It's really nice, just to kind of, you know, <laughs> ease us in, and it's not quite so awkward when, Bru <laughs> you know, when people are, you know, gathering. It's not like you're in a room where you can go up to someone and, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of froze in the moment too, and you, I, you gave me a nice little nudge. So, it's like, <laughs> but anyways, thank you. That'd be great. Thanks, Riley. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's so good to see the walkers again. Oh, my goodness. Without it's, masks. It's good to be seen. <laughs> it is good to be seen. Ah. Wow. The only way I see people without masks is in, in Zoom meetings. Yes. I know. It, it's so right. nice. Your glasses don't fog up. I know. Masks. I know. Right. Well, Riley has, Al Riley has all kinds of amazing things that he is learning with our Zoom technology. Um, one being of a, um, did you mention that to him? No, I didn't get a chance. What, what was the name of it again? It's called Prezi. And yeah. it's, have you seen it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, where you can basically have like a, almost, it's like you're touching the, the slides as you go through. I don't mm -hmm. know. I haven't played with it yet, but I thought it was really interesting. Have, have we done that, Al? Have we used that before? Not on Zoom. Uh, we've used Prezi's in other uh, platforms, but not on Zoom. So that, do we have a Prezi account then? Uh, David Richardson would know that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Riley, maybe you should get with David um, because that would be, I'll give him your information because if we do, then you might have access to a lot more than you know. And David may have, I don't think David's ever used it with Zoom. But it would be a, but he may have. Richard knows. Richard would know too that answer. Okay. That sounds great. All right. If awesome. We, if y'all had like a made up, you know, kind of a, not like what you have, but like for Al's talk, if there's like, like key bullet points or something that you have, you know, you could put those up as you're talking. But I don't know if that's a distraction from the message too sometimes. You know, I don't know. Well, Al, you want to let us know what you think about that? I, if you want to incorporate that kind of thing into this presentation? I'd love to do that. <laughs> I told you, I told you, you were going to open up a big old bag of something. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Bag of tricks. Pull out. It is. It is. Bag of tricks. <laughs> well, I think we should play with it. I think it's, um, I think it would be effective and it's a good thing to have a visual. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I think what we do is grand, but as it continues and, and we're in this platform, I think it's a, and people are more and more on Zoom now. Um, not that it's common, but I just, I feel like that's just another way to add an extra point, have a piece of scripture up there, something like that, I think would be a, a bonus mm -hmm. or, you know, but, but that's, of course, you're the one leading the talk. So it would really come out of your head and would need to get to Riley early enough where he could prepare it. Okay. Yep. Let me know, yep. Riley. Okay. Uh, a question. Uh, are the talks recorded? Are they somewhere or not? Oops. We're recording now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, up there. Okay. Mm -hmm.